Well, good morning, everybody. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Daryl Lutz, and I'm a wildlife biologist uh, for the Wyoming Game and Fish Department in our Lander region. On behalf of the Waffle Wild Sheep Working Group, Mike Cox, the organizing committee, and I bid you a good morning and thank you for taking your day to spend with us. It is our pleasure to host this workshop based on bighorn sheep disease and pneumonia management. Today we'll have the opportunity to interact with scientists and managers from throughout the US and Canada as they share their experiences with the ever increasing struggle of pneumonia and declining bighorn sheep populations. We've structured the day so we can learn more about the implementation and effectiveness of test and remove in several populations. We'll then listen to other managers who are struggling with declining bighorn sheep populations and evaluate whether similar management actions may be appropriate. Finally, we'll end the day with some discussions and updates on jurisdictions experiences with depopulation and preparation or implementation of reintroductions. We've provided a lot of time, we hope, today for a lot of interaction. So please be ready to ask questions and engage with one another to the extent our virtual world allows. We welcome those of you who may not be a manager or researcher, but ask that you be aware we have a limited amount of time for those folks to interact and evaluate the information or situations at hand. I think it's fair to say that we are all in when it comes to bighorn sheep and their future. We all recognize the gravity and level of frustration with diseases, in particular pneumonia, as they impact our herds. It's our hope that as new information and experiences develop, workshops like this one will be valuable to you as you consider next steps in the management of your herds. So I just wrote some notes the other day, not wanting to duplicate, but bear with me for about four minutes. Well, I moved to Southwest Idaho about a year ago. For the past six plus years, our Wild Sheep Foundation World Headquarters have been located in Bozeman. This was after a 34 year run of headquarters in Cody, Wyoming. Later today, you'll be hearing from Dr. Peregrine Wolf, who will be moderating much of today's sessions. Many of you might know Perry from her time as wildlife vet for the Nevada Department of Wildlife. What some of you might not know is that after stepping away from Endow, Perry took on an important role as executive manager of the Wildlife Disease Association, succeeding Dr. Dave Jessup, long retired from Cal Fish and Game. To balance out the challenges and hard work of her position with WDA, Perry wished to pursue the lighter, funner side of wildlife conservation so she volunteered to serve on the WSF Board of Directors. And for more than the past year, Perry's been our board chair. And safe to say, no issues, controversies, or challenges there, huh, Perry? <laughs> Perry's been at the forefront of wild sheep health and management challenges around the West. We consider ourselves very fortunate to have her as a fearless leader. Also participating today are my WSF conservation staff bros, Clay Brewer in Texas and Kurt Alton, Montana. Combined, we've been in the business of wild sheep management for almost 125 years. We have watched and cursed as bighorn sheep individuals have died and once healthy herds have dwindled. We are keenly interested in hearing from the assembled experts for this workshop, and we expect to learn from many of them. I've had the privilege of working on wild sheep conservation efforts with many of you over the past 40 years, and I do look forward to my next 40. Um, I count my time as the first chair of the Waffle Wild Sheep Working Group as one of the highlights of my professional career, but also one of the most challenging. Like Daryl started, I want to thank you all for zooming into this important workshop. I'd like to thank Mike Cox and Daryl Lutz for their lead roles in organizing today's workshop and the organizing committee who helped shape and hone the comprehensive agenda before you today. For 100 years, 1922 is the first record I could ever come up with. For 100 years, Western agencies have been transplanting bighorn sheep into historic ranges. For nearly 50 years, the Wild Sheep Foundation has helped underwrite many trap and transplant operations in nearly 20 jurisdictions in the Western US and Canada. 
WSF has raised and directed more than $135 million toward wild sheep conservation and management, primarily in North America, but around the globe as well. As part of our mission and purpose, the Wild Sheep Foundation, our network of chapters and affiliates, and our many dedicated volunteers work extra hard to put and keep wild sheep on the mountain. In the last five decades, the collective wild sheep management toolbox has grown from a few basic tools to a huge assemblage of sophisticated tools for detecting challenges to wild sheep health and conservation, developing and implementing strategies to respond to those challenges, all in an effort to put and keep wild sheep on the mountains we all cherish. There has been too long a litany of bighorn sheep herds that have winked out from respiratory pneumonia. Those of you who know me know I have a strong memory and I will never forget an article written in the 1980s by Dr. Tom Thorne, who was our long-term wildlife vet for Wyoming Game and Fish. Tom's article in Wyoming Wildlife Magazine was titled, quote, born looking for a place to die, end quote. Tom's point was that despite living in some of the toughest places on the planet, bighorn sheep were so very fragile when it came to respiratory challenges. Those of us who have been around a while have run through a gauntlet of suspected causes from lungworms to pastorellas, from stress-induced pneumonia to moby, on and on. Bighorn sheep keep dying and wild sheep managers and conservations keep trying. Today, we'll hear from a variety of wild sheep managers and researchers who have developed, experimented with, and implemented some very novel strategies to help keep wild sheep healthy and on our mountains. From British Columbia to Nebraska, from Hell's Canyon to the Dakotas, from Colorado to Oregon, from Nevada to Montana, many places in between, test and removal of sick bighorns has been tried. While the results to date may be somewhat mixed, and we'll hear that today, our commitment to wild sheep has not and will not waver. We look forward to hearing and learning from the experiences of this exceptional group of managers and researchers gathered today. We designed this workshop to be interactive. We are confident that a lot of great information will be shared today. Welcome to our workshop. Thank you for participating. Thank you for what you all do for wild sheep. Let's get after it. I'm gonna turn it over to Mike Cox, Chair of the Waffle Wild Sheep Working Group. Thanks Kevin for that introduction and for your broad and insightful thoughts for this morning. Uh, you heard from Kevin um, about our session moderator. I uh, wanted to introduce her a little bit more. I had the pleasure to work with her for a decade starting in 2010. Uh, with her passion and vision, she was instrumental in initiating with me and other key wildlife sheep professionals, the Westwide Adaptive Wild Sheep Disease Management Venture, that are known as the DMV. We started that in 2015. And this workshop is exactly the forum the DMV has been promoting to improve our collective learning and evaluate new disease management actions. So helping Perry today will be Kezia Manlove. <clears throat> she will be our Zoom chat moderator. She's a wildlife professional or a professor at Utah State University, focused on all aspects of wild sheep disease ecology, from its spatial and temporal dynamics to seeking solutions. I've been extremely fortunate to have worked with her and contracted with her to uh, be the benefactor of her analytical magic. I'm pretty much handed her the keys to all of the Nevada Bighorn data starting in 2018 to analyze all aspects of our Bighorn disease challenges to help us overcome them. So big thanks for Kezia for managing our chat today and for Perry overseeing our sessions. Thanks, Mike. We ready to take it away? <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. Um, I just wanna thank you, Kevin and Mike, for those introductions. Very nice, thank you. Um, 
I'm really excited about this workshop. I think it's going to be fantastic. And as, been, as, as has been mentioned, this is going to be an opportunity for us to have a lot of dialogue. And as a session moderator, one of my jobs is to try to keep everybody on time. And so I'm going to be very strict about that because there's a lot of folks and I think there's going to be a lot of questions. This entire um, session is being recorded and Renee has had a commitment to get this out uh, available to the participants um, within a two week period, which is fantastic. So I'm urging you to really try to pay attention to the talks that are going on because everything is going to be pre-recorded. Um, just a quick note about questions. Um, if your questions aren't answered, we will get them answered. So don't, um, don't worry about that. But back again to staying on time, presenters, if you go over, um, I will ask you to please stop because it is so important for us to have question and time for questions and answers. We're gonna kick off the morning today um, with the science and foundation of the test and remove projects. And our first speaker is going to be Francis Kassir. Francis is a wildlife research biologist with the Idaho Department of Fish and Game. She has done extensive research since 1996 with the bighorn sheep in the Hell's Canyon ecosystem. And I think we can all agree it's because of her pioneering work with the application of test and cull as a potential management technique to clear herds chronically infected with mycoplasma ova pneumoniae that we are actually all sitting here today having this workshop. So I would like to turn this over right now to Francis Kassir. Francis, are you okay sharing your screen? All right, working on it. Okay, we see coming up. Perfect. All good? Yep, just put it on present mode. Can you see it? We see your uh, PowerPoint yep. file, but not the presentation. Okay. So just go to the slideshow and put it on the presenting mode. Yeah, sorry, I shared the wrong screen. Figures I would. Oh, no worries. There we go. Is that better? Yep, that looks perfect. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Sorry, everybody. Uh, thanks, Perry, for that very nice introduction. Um, I'm really excited to be here um, to share some information and to learn from other people about test and remove. Uh, before I start, I'd like to put this presentation into context. And many people have contributed to research in Hell's Canyon in many different ways, but there are three people that I think are were important specifically in development of the ideas that led to what we're here to talk about today. Uh, the first is my PhD advisor, Tony Sinclair. Um, and Tony had made a career of intentionally designing and conducting field studies as a basis for natural and manipul manipulative experiments. And he was influential in structuring the research in Hell's Canyon from the start. The second person is Tom Besser, who you'll hear from uh, next. And um, he addressed the, the qu basic question of what pathogen was causing pneumonia and um, has, you know, kind of changed the whole paradigm of pneumonia and bighorn sheep. And finally, Raina Plowright. Um, I met Raina when she was a Smith Fellow uh, and had a project to uh, study disease and connectivity in bighorn sheep. And she brought the perspective of um, disease ecology to the project. And she also brought a great group of people with her, uh, including Kezia Manlove, who is here today. And the work that she led was crucial for developing 
developing the idea of the chronic carrier. So there are three aspects to this work, the field studies, the microbiology, and the disease ecology. On this talk, I am gonna focus on the um, research that are the re kind of the science behind test and test and remove. Um, I have another talk where I'll talk, well, I'll speak more specifically to the work that we did in Hell's Canyon. So I'll start with some, but I will start with some background of the Hell's Canyon project and how we got here. Uh, I will talk about the MOV hypothesis and the chronic carrier hypothesis, which are the two bases for test and remove. And then I, I'll describe the first attempt at test and remove in Hell's Canyon, and then talk about transitioning to management in a future direction. So the Hell's Canyon initiative, as Perry said, I've been this in this uh, business for a long time, and it was started in 1995 to restore self-sustaining um, bighorn sheep populations to suitable habitat. And it was a partnership between the states of Idaho, Oregon, Washington, the BLM, the Forest Service, and the Wild Sheep Foundation that was put together after the closure of uh, some Forest Service domestic sheep allotments. And the objective was to jumpstart a restoration of um, bighorn sheep in the canyon. And it was, um, I think the, the idea was probably that we'd do a lot of um, reintroductions and really get things going. Um, Sorry, uh, the Hell's Canyon is a reintroduced bighorn sheep population. It's a meta population with uh, 71 or 17 populations and the reintroduction started in 1971. Right after uh, the initiative was put together, uh, unfortunately we had a pneumonia outbreak in the north part of the canyon and we spent a lot of time and effort trying to stop it, but eventually it spread through five populations in Washington, Oregon, and into Idaho. And now we know from looking at the MOB strain types that it affected almost every population in the Hell's Canyon Initiative area. So it was an indication that disease was probably gonna be an important part of this project. And it was also a validate, it validated the idea of the um, working together across jurisdictional boundaries. So the year after the outbreak, uh, we had really poor lamb survival as is almost inevitably the case. And um, Mike Miller from Colorado Division of Wildlife and I co collaborated on an idea that he had to test out U vaccination as a means to improve lamb survival. And we had designed an experiment with treatments and controls in three populations and in some U's that had been, been removed from Hell's Canyon and were at the Fish and Game Captive Wildlife Center. We used two vaccines that targeted Mannheimia hemolytica, Bieberstinia, which was then known as Pastorella triolosi, and Pastorella multocida. And we vaccinated 18 ewes in uh, Hell's Canyon and four captive ewes in March and had um, other ewes got uh, placebos. And so um, this, the idea was to boost lamb survival, but unfortunately, um, the vaccinated ewes actually had surprisingly slightly lower lamb survival than the ewes that weren't vaccinated. In the meantime, there is a lot of, still a lot of interest in restoration. So we conducted five translocations totaling 115 sheep from BC, Alberta, Montana, and sheep. We also moved sheep around within Hell's Canyon and we established sheep populations in three new places and supplemented other populations put a huge amount of effort into getting sheep into release sites using, as depicted here, jet boats, helicopters, whatever means. And, and uh, but success was mixed. And while, you know, it wasn't a total loss, we did develop, we did establish some new populations. It wasn't what we had hoped for. And not surprisingly, disease was an issue. So, um, in, a, we, in an effort to test some of the possible contributors to disease at the time, we supplemented with mineral blocks and medicated with um, wormer and venbendazole and, and ivermectin. And we found that 
Um, you know, we could increase selenium levels in some places, um, and we could reduce lungworm loads, but neither of these helped lamb survival. And finally, uh, we tried here, this is, uh, you may, some of you may know Vic Coggins, uh, and this is a Lostine population, which you hear about a lot about today. Um, and we vaccinated, or we, he injected um, bighorn sheep on the winter range with Draxin to try to improve lamb survival. Um, he gave the vaccine to the antibiotic to 28 ewes over the winter, and only two lambs survived. So clearly, um, this as as I finished my PhD, I I realized that you know I just probably knew that before, but you know I've showed that disease was limiting the population. This is just plots of rates of population growth with and without pneumonia. So uh, after that, I'm, I met Tom Besser at WSU and we did some work together and uh, Tom figured out that there was this pathogen mycoplasma of, of pneumonia, MOV, that was in the um, lambs with disease, but not the lambs that were healthy. And um, he was really convinced, he used some, and he used some technology that we hadn't had before, some DNA technology. And he was really convinced that this was, this was gonna be the cause, this was the cause. And I was a little more skeptical because as Kevin sort of alluded to, we've been through a lot of different um, hypotheses about uh, what, what the pathogen was. And um, you know, many people have been very sure each time that, that they knew what the pathogen was. However, unlike the other pathogens, um, the MOV hypothesis has ultimately held up under further investigation and scrutiny. And these are just, um, I'm gonna list a few um, criteria that are used to assess the whether a pathogen is causing a disease and or whether just what is the cause of a disease. And one is that um, the strength of association. So MOV has a very strong association with disease. It's been shown to be present in mnemonic and absent healthy lambs and adults. And in a survey of 68 populations across 11 states in Alberta, MOV was detected in all 36 populations that were considered mnemonic and only three of 32 that were considered healthy. There's a, a temporal relationship. Pneumonia outbreaks in previously healthy populations are accompanied by invasion, or pneumonia outbreaks are accompanied by invasion of, of MOV, as I'll show an example of in Hell's Canyon in a few minutes. It makes sense that MOV is associated with Capernaum. It's common in domestic sheep, which have long been observed to be associated with dios and bighorn sheep, but it's not found in cattle, horses, and other livestock that generally have not been shown to pose a disease risk for wild sheep. Also, many of the lesions seen in mnemonic bighorn sheep are consistent with respiratory mycoplasma infections. Captain, there's been a number of experiments that have supported evidence, uh, supported the MOV hypothesis. For example, most sheep die when, bighorn sheep die when commingled with domestic sheep colonized with MOV. But in two experiments, most bighorn sheep commingled with domestic sheep not carrying MOV. Um, the bighorn sheep survived for 100 days until the end of the experiment. And finally, the, there is a similar um, disease in swine, a respiratory disease that um, is caused by a closely related species of mycoplasma. So test to remove is based on um, this conceptual MOB model. First of all, MOB is an introduced pathogen. Bighorn sheep aren't adapted to it. Uh, and, and once um, MOB is introduced, um, there's typically an all-age outbreak occurs. Now, does this mean that every time MOB is, the bighorn sheep are exposed to MOB that um, they die? That, no, it doesn't. And does it mean that all pneumonia in bighorn sheep is caused by MOB? No, it doesn't. But if, if you see this kind of a pattern, um, 
there's a very low, uh, if you don't have MOB, there's very low likelihood of this kind of pattern um, occurring of the all age outbreaks followed by the chronic infection and outbreaks in labs. So the test to remove is focused on the um, part of the disease that occurs after the all age outbreak or survivors um, are, some of the survivors are, are carriers of MOB and these uh, ewes transmit MOB to lambs. And the hope of um, test remove is to promote clearance MOB as opposed to having a cycle of continual reinfection uh, of lambs and creation of new chronic carriers. This is a rather busy picture, but it was pretty um, influential in some of the ideas that I had, I came up with. Um, it's a plot that's based on confirmed pneumonia deaths of 63 adults and 115 lambs. And the black circles are, are pneumonia in adults. The gray circles are when pneumonia was detected in lambs and the open squares are um, healthy, our status was healthy and blank, it means there's no data. And this is basically showing um, on the y-axis are popu the populations in Hell's Canyon. And then on the x-axis are the years. And so it's showing the history of pneumonia in Hell's Canyon from 1995 to 2010. And populations are ordered geographically next to their nearest neighbor. So you can see this outbreak in 1995 that I mentioned earlier, um, occurred in four populations and the first year and then spread to a second one the next year. So it's fairly synchronous. Um, and then as expected, um, we detected pneumonia in the lambs next year. And, and as I mentioned earlier, we had really low lamb survival. And this seems to be consistent um, that the year after an all age outbreak, uh, there will be pneumonia in lambs. After that though, the pattern can be highly variable. But, and as you can see here, there's years of pneumonia um, in lambs and then interspersed with actually healthy years. But these two populations are right next to each other, across from each other on the Snake River. And you can see that there's not any synchrony in when the healthy years are. And um, so to me, um, this, suggested that what was going on was something, was not some kind of a large scale process. It was something that was happening um, within the population. And in every population, there were some healthy years. Um, Sometimes, usually it was just a year or two and never more than three. And then we got, had got pneumonia again. So we kept thinking we were getting out of it and then we'd get, it would come back. So it seemed like something was just sort of flipping the population from being healthy to uh, pneumonia, to having pneumonia. And, you know, now that looking back on it, it's consistent of, or actually, you know, initially it seemed consistent with maybe just having one or two carrier U's that maybe didn't have a lamb one year or one of them died or they died or whatever. So, um, Finally, there, we did have one population, a certain population that remained healthy throughout this period. Although, um, as you'll see, the next year um, it had a pneumonia outbreak in 2011. So the chronic carrier hypothesis that kind of came out of this um, time series of pneumonia and bighorn sheep um, is based on the fact that it's well, pretty well accepted that in many diseases, individuals differ in their contribution, contribution to the spread. And there can be, they can be called different things, super spreaders, um, super shedders, chronic carriers, all of which I have names I have used. Actually, super spreaders you might could, could use to describe 
animals that have a lot of contacts, super shedders to describe animals that have high infection loads and chronic carriers to detect, to describe animals that are have long duration of infection. Another alternative hypothesis is that there are always only a few carriers, but they're not always the same individuals. It's just kind of moving, just moving around in the population. So to test this hypothesis, um, intensively sampled sheep for four years on the last dean. And this, this is, these are the results, the animal, the points in red are MOV PCR positive and black PCR negative. And it supports the idea that there were certain individuals that um, were consistently positive for MOV. And that was um, actually about 37% of the population at the time. And 45% were, we considered intermittently positive. And then there was only 18% were actually truly negative. Looking back on analysis of high prevalence of infection relative to other populations. And we'll hear more about possible reasons for that. Um, we also found that um, from these data that the probability of um, an animal of, if, of a second test, consecutive test being the same as, well, as the probability of an animal testing consistently the same after one test, testing the same on the next test at 75%, but after two consecutive tests, the probability of it testing positive on a third test is 90%. So that's kind of where we get the idea that I'll talk about of, of testing animals twice uh, to determine whether they're chronic carriers. Also, we found that um, from tests in Lostine, from sampling in Lostine and other places in Hell's Canyon, that lambs have the highest um, rate of infection in, in, of MOV, so almost 90%, both in Lostine and in other populations. Um, and then yearlings also have a higher probability, higher prevalence. Um, although uh, most lambs have cleared it by the time they are become yearlings, and then adults have a relatively low rate of infection. So now I'll move on to the, um, our, the initial experiment that we did in Hell's Canyon to test the, uh, the chronic carrier hypothesis and the MOV hypothesis. So um, we um, first population we worked in was a Soton, Washington, and at the same time, Chad Lehman was working um, in Custer State Park, and he's going to talk about that later on. And we had, on both studies, we had controls, which were untreated populations. Also, at this, we um, uh, started some, with the help of Dan Walsh from the National Wildlife Health Center, we started some captive studies at SDSU and WSU, and Tom Besser will be talking about that next. So in the Soton, um, test to remove. So this is a little bit about the population. It was about 110 sheep prior to the pneumonia epizootic. Uh, along with um, the pneumonia, contagious eczema showed up um, during the outbreak. And that had been something we'd seen in other pop Hell's Canyon populations that year, which is not usually, we don't usually see it. Um, after the outbreak, we had the um, pneumonia and low lamb survival. And then um, we sampled not every ewe, but tw almost every ewe and a few rams um, over the next, over the years 2013 to 2014. And we resampled ewes that were positive. And then we moved two repeatedly positive ewes to, S to our captive study at SDSU. And then we also, at, coincidentally, how these things happen, there was a ram near the town of Asotin that, um, turned out to be MOV positive and he was moved to, M to WSU. And we also moved uh, some other sheep to, to our research project at SDSU. And here's the uh, timeline of the population. Um, here's the pneumonia outbreak right after the population was really seemed to be taken off. And then low lamb survival and then we started test and remove. Here's a timeline of the MOV infection status. 
Um, the population had been healthy, like I said, for um, as long as we'd been monitored it. And then the first time MOV was detected was during the pneumonia outbreak. And then we um, conducted test to remove and MOV hasn't been um, detected since in six years. Um, the antibody status, again, no antibodies to MOV before the outbreak. And then um, a very high level of um, antibody prevalence during the outbreak and shortly after, then we conducted test to remove and the antibody prevalence declined um, over the subsequent years. Although we still have um, one U that consistently tests antibody positive and she's a U that went through the outbreak and I'm not sure, I, can, I, I guess I wouldn't say it's a false positive because she has been exposed, but she's never, she's never stopped producing antibodies. Overall, this is just a general picture of antibody um, persistence following clearance of MOV. It takes about two years, and it differs in different populations, but it takes about two years for most sheep to um, lose detectable antibodies on this ELISA test. So our uh, sum summary of the Asotin study was that, you know, we had a healthy population and the pneumonia coincided with the first detections of MOV. We conducted the test to remove, no pneumonia or MOV was has been detected since then. Um, and like I mentioned earlier previously, no fade out of pneumonia lasted for more than three years and it's been six years. Um, and um, pneumonia and MOV continue to be detected detected in the control populations. So the MOV hypothesis was strongly supported. And we also found support for the chronic carrier hypothesis because we only removed two sheep that were positive or plus the RAM, two ewes and a RAM. Um, unfortunately, lamb recruitment has improved, but the population hasn't rebounded like we thought it would. And it, there's, it just seems like there's a bunch of other things that have happened after the outbreak. However, um, it was enough to um, convince us to keep going in Hell's Canyon. And so in my next talk, I'll, talk, I'll, I'll um, show some better population responses to test and remove in different places in Hell's Canyon. So I'm not gonna really talk much about the user guide today, but um, these are the recommendations, um, which you know can be modified, but for um, conducting tests to remove. And first of all, test I put all in quotes because in most populations, it's very difficult to detect all or to test all adult all use um, to capture them all. So um, I think we showed in the Soden and, and some of the other. Um, um, test remove that we've done in other populations that you don't have to test every single adult necessarily. Just test as many as you can. Hopefully it's most of them. And then um, just retest any positives the next year to distinguish the chronic from the intermittent carriers. And this is based on the data from the last scene and also from elsewhere in Hell's Canyon. And then though um, following the removal, to um, confirm that you've that MOV has been cleared, you should test the lambs born after the outbreak with both the nasal swabs and blood, and they should be um, PCR and serum antibody negative. And because the infection rate of lambs is, or because the prevalence of infection is so high in MOV positive populations, infection rate in lambs, um, you should only have to sample, you know, you don't have to go back and sample the whole population. You could sample three to five lambs and you should be able to detect MOV if it's there. So in my, my vision for future direction is I'd like to see, you know, as a researcher, I'd like to see how we can, how can we optimize this technique to minimize the amount of testing and removal that's needed? And, you know, can we identify certain areas, you know, of the, of a 
of a population or metapopulation that are kind of hotspots that are keeping infection um, or maintaining transmission within the population. And when I talk about the work in Hell's Canyon, you'll see kind of why I can't think this might be happening. And then also it would be great if we could look, if we could find characteristics associated with chronic carriage that could be detected without testing or capturing. And are there any other management act actions that involve no or minimal capture that could facilitate natural cl clearance based on the MOV and chronic carrier hypothesis? So with that, I thank you all for listening. I'm really excited about this workshop and especially thank you to many organizations and agencies and people who have supported the work in Hell's Canyon. Thank you, Francis. That was an excellent talk and a great way to start out the day. Um, okay, we're gonna, as I said, we'll hold questions till after we've heard from Tom. And so I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Tom Besser, <clears throat> who's a retired with the emphasis on retired professor of microbiology from Washington State University, and he also served on the fac faculty of the Washington Animal Disease and Diagnostic Lab. And I believe anybody that's uh, dealt with bighorn sheep uh, disease testing has probably spoken directly with Tom um, throughout his career. <clears throat> Tom's research focused on the epidemiology and ecology of infectious disease caused by pathogens transmitted across host species. He also directed the graduate program in immunology and infectious diseases at WSU. And I think as a result of that, we know we've got many um, upcoming brilliant stars that are interested in working, continuing the great work with um, wild sheep. And again, it's because of Tom's work with epidemiology of MOV and bighorn sheep that, uh, and what he's done with Francis and all of us that we're having this workshop today. So it's my pleasure to introduce Tom Besser. Thanks, Barry. <clears throat> Let's see if I can uh, get this to work. There we go. Can you all see PowerPoint? Perfect. <clears throat> so I'm going to just uh, give a really brief talk about the um, captive experiments that Frances mentioned in her talk, and I'm mostly going to talk uh, just about that part of it that was done at WSU, and then I'll swing back to include the South Dakota studies that were done in parallel um, on the last slide. Um, and basically, this is a project that um, a, a student at the time, Logan Wayan, um, uh, participated with along with uh, Frances and I. And uh, Title is commingling with the chronic MOV carrier U predicts lamb pneumonia in captive bighorn sheep. And that's pretty self explanatory, I think. WSU's had a captive bighorn sheep, uh, have several groups of captive bighorn sheep for a number of years. And I inherited the sheep that were at WSU when I um, was appointed to the Rocky Crate chair uh, uh, a while back now. <laughs> so, though, particular group of uh, bighorn sheep that are going to be the subject of most of what I talk about today were acquired by WSU or were, um, were, were received at WSU in March 2014 um, through the generosity of Montana Game Fish and Parks. And these were six U's, I believe they were from Rock Creek, Montana. They were received by my predecessor, Dr. Shukamaran. Uh, so I don't really have much detail about them except that the entire group, when they um, were tested um, and as they arrived at WSU, uh, were PCR not detected for MOV, even though they were all antibody positive. And Rock Creek had experienced uh, pneumonia outbreak um, in that cluster of outbreaks that happened back in 2009, 2010, if I, um, if I have the situation correctly there. So um, a couple of months after they arrived at WSU, um, pregnant, they all lambed, and no pneumonia was observed in these lambs um, in that first lambing season at, after arrival at WSU. However, I'm not sure how well they were um, a monitor of that because 
Dr. Shukumaran's graduate student was um, grabbing uh, the lambs at a very young age and bottle uh, raising them. And they had uh, some issues with uh, failure of passive transfer and lost a lot of lambs quite young. But among the lambs that did, uh, that did um, reach an appropriate age, no pneumonia was observed. <clears throat> and again, before I got the sheep um, in the fall of 2014, um, an aerosol challenge was conducted using a nasal wash from an MOV positive domestic sheep. And then that wash was administered using an aerosol generator. And as I understand it, the intention was to infect or to challenge or challenge expose a single uh, bighorn sheep. But apparently the aerosol challenge was uh, more effective than planned and um, the entire group of bighorn sheep in three separate pens all simultaneously became infected with the domestic sheep strain of MOV. And in fact, an all age outbreak of respiratory disease ensued. Um, I'll show you in the next slide um, the time course of testing and, and so on. But this is the group of sheep that were used in uh, three years of experiments I'm going to talk about this morning. In one of those years, we also looked at a group of uh, bighorn sheep um, that were, uh, again, uh, kindly uh, contributed to the program from, in this case, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. And these were used in the um, 2018 experiment only. And as I mentioned before, I'm not going to really talk about the parallel experiments conducted at SDSU, but they were similar in many ways. So this is the serial testing uh, outcomes for the group of Rock Creek ewes uh, that were uh, the main subjects of the three years of experiments. So their names are on the left there. Um, in the spring, they were received in 2014. And that following summer, all of these youth tested negative for MOV on two occasions. That fall of 2014 is when the uh, domestic sheep challenge happened. And the next time they were sampled, which was in the spring of 2015, uh, most of them were MOV positive still at that time. And the strain of MOV matched the strain that was in the uh, challenge inoculum. Uh, later that year, um, more of the animals had cleared. And by the fall of 2015, or a year after that outbreak, there was just one MOV positive U remaining, and the others were um, MOV not detected by PCR. And that pattern has persisted um, pretty much till the current day. Um, in other words, that single um, U re has remained positive on every time we've tested her. She's now uh, dead, so she doesn't test positive anymore. And the other ones have tested negative every time we've tested them, even though they've been mostly managed in one or two groups commingled. So I think it was Francis that realized that this was an excellent situation to test the hypothesis that these MOV uh, positive views had a key role to play in um, uh, determining whether a group of sheep have lambs that have pneumonia or not by uh, moving that U between different groups of non-carriers, um, you could see how important the role she played versus the others. So the hypothesis that lambs are born in pens containing uh, at least one MOV carrier U uh, will experience pneumonia. And this slide summarizes the first year's study. So in the uh, upper left, um, our carrier U has got the golden uh, halo around her. The other five U's are the ones that had tested at this point, um, consistently negative on six tests at least in a row. Um, and we segregated them into two, two pens. The first pen contained the carrier and just one of the non-carrier U's and the four other non-carrier U's in the second pen. And the outcome with pneumonia is uh, uh, shown by the uh, frame around the lambs. Uh, the two lambs in, in the carrier pen one both developed pneumonia, and none of the lambs in the other pen with the four nine carriers uh, developed pneumonia. And this year, uh, both of these mnemonic lambs uh, died of pneumonia at a very typical age for what's seen um, with MOV um, infected populations. So the next year, we took that uh, non carrier UA out of the first pen and replaced her with a couple of the U's from the non carrier pen and put her in with the other remaining non-carrier ewes. And we added some more ewes. In this case, these are the organs from the Lostine and their um, sampling uh, strip chart is shown at the bottom here. Uh, four ewes 
And you can see by the predominance of yellow that these uh, use tested positive nearly every time they had been tested, both in the Wasteen, in the wild, on the winter uh, bean grounds, and also at WSU after they were transferred to WSU um, every time. So these are all, all carrier, MLB carrier use. And so that second year experiment, we had three pens. In the first pen, as before, we had that uh, one carrier from the Montana sheep with two non-carriers, um, and they produced three lambs with pneumonia that developed pneumonia a month or so after uh, being born. The second pen, the non-carrier pen, had the three non-carrier use. No pneumonia was seen in any of those use. Um, and in the second carrier pen containing the four used from Wasteen, only two of which uh, were pregnant when they re were received at WSU, uh, both of their lambs um, did develop pneumonia. And of these five mnemonic lambs, four of the lambs uh, died of pneumonia. Uh, but one survived and it recovered um, and we followed it along and it eventually became PCR negative uh, about a year and a half later. In the third year of the experiment, we figured that combined with the results at South Dakota State University, the basic outlines of the carrier U hypothesis predicting lamb pneumonia have been pretty well supported. So we decided to get fancy and wondered how important is the lamb of the carrier U as serving as a, um, a conduit for MOV from the carrier U to the lamb group, which would then interact with the other lambs and maybe spread it. To, to the other lamb. So we did not breed the carrier this fourth view, and we put the four surviving non-carrier um, ewes in that pen uh, with her, and they all lambed, and all four of those lambs did develop pneumonia. One of those pneumonic lambs died. The other three survived though, and they all recovered. And again, they all three became PCR negative by about a year afterwards. So um, I don't have actually a complete um, tally of the results of this. This slide show, it was one that was uh, made by Logan Land uh, for a presentation. And it shows the tally of pneumonia versus no pneumonia um, in pens containing carrier use compared to pens with non-carrier use combined between WSU and South Dakota State University but it does not include the third year of experiments at WSU. So there'd be an additional uh, one pen and several animals added to this. But basically there's a perfect association here. Um, 19 lambs born in, a, uh, born in a pen containing a carrier, you develop pneumonia um, and no lambs born in a pen not containing a carrier, you uh, develop pneumonia. And you can analyze this either at the individual lamb um, level or at the pen level. And both of them are highly significant. There's pretty much perfect association. Um, so I think the hypothesis that the carriers in the U group are an essential part of generation of lamb pneumonia associated with MLB is, is well supported. Um, it, it also consistent with fr what Francis had seen in um, a certain um, and elsewhere is that the, let the lambs have a high infection rate, but if they survive the pneumonia, uh, they tend to clear infection more often than not. And a couple of notes that you may find interesting. Um, I didn't go into the reasons, I didn't really want to take the time, but all the lambs that survived pneumonia in these uh, studies, which wasn't a very great number, but some did, um, there's reason to believe they might have experienced lower or later exposure to MOV infected or carrier animals than the ones that died. Um, and that would be interesting because it, it might help start explaining some of the variability Francis mentioned earlier that's seen in the wild from year to year and from population to population. And the second note that um, you may find interesting is that all five of the chronic MOV carrier ewes um, that I described in this and used in these studies did have a uh, sinus tumor uh, at necropsy. Um, so that's, that's all I have to discuss uh, today about the Captive experiments, I think they really do support the um, role of chronic carrier use in lamb pneumonia um, in this disease, the corn sheep. Turn it back to you, Perry. Do I have to unshare? Thank 
Thank you, Tom. That was excellent. And thank you, Francis. Okay, we now have time for questions and I've seen that there's a number of them popping up on the chat. I don't see any hands raised at the moment. So my chat master, Kezia Manlove, um, Kezia, do you wanna forward some of these, read some of these questions that have popped up through the, through these past two talks? Yes, um, I am happy to. So, um, and Justice Allen asked about the size of the Asotan herd. Francis, I think you're gonna get into that shortly, correct? The Asotan herd was 110 sheep when we started, I guess, yeah. And, we, and in, we've, uh, I, I think in the next talk, I'll talk, I'll talk about some other populations that were larger than, or that were, I guess, a hunt smaller than that and up to 100 sheep when we started. So yeah. if you um, think of the Hell's Canyon population though, or meta population, you know, it's 900 sheep. And I think that was one thing that I was, when I started, and this is kind of getting into my next talk, but I'll just say that um, the reason we started with the Soton was because it was relatively small after the outbreak. And, you know, so it was 110 before the outbreak, I should say, after the outbreak, it was about 60. Um, maybe that's what Ann was asking, sorry about that. Um, but uh, we, the, we selected the first, um, experiments to do the first experiments in small populations that were accessible because we wanted to, you know, test the science, not test our ability to actually get in and do it. So, um, and the reason we didn't tr try Hell's Canyon as a whole is because it was fairly daunting. Um, but then uh, when we uh, had good luck with uh, Soton, you know, we decided to give it a try. So, I guess, in terms of thinking about how big a, your population is and whether you you should try it, um, yeah, you should you should consider it. Um, there might be some ways to get around it, and I'll talk about that more later. Um, another one that came up. So Jennifer Ramsey asked about the the range of herd sizes to which this has been applied, and whether that's an important factor for success. I think we should hold that one for now because we'll probably get into it after we've heard through the set of case studies. Um, uh, Jessica Jennings Gaines um, asked about some of the factors that um, seem to kind of co-conspire to keep a certain small afterwards. Do you want to deal with that now? It's a good question. I mean, there's a lot, it just seems to be, you name it. Um, we've had, um, you know, animal, first of all, it's a small population, right? Because after the outbreak, we only have 20 to 30 years. So it doesn't take much adult mortality to keep the population from growing. And um, we've had, you know, just normal things like, accidents, um, uh, some weird, you know, not other diseases besides pneumonia. We've had um, some um, cougar predation and some human caused mortality, but none of them has been like overwhelming. It's just a little bit of everything. And so I don't know if there's something that makes the sheep more susceptible to those things now than they were before, or if it's just that it's a small population and it's just running through a, a string of bad luck. Um, uh, Vanna asked, do you think um, that stuttering transmission should kind of be discarded as a model or is that, or, or what is your feeling on the evidence for chronic carriage versus the stuttering transmission model? I think the evidence for chronic carriage is very strong. So I'm going um, with the chronic a, carriage model. Okay. Um, we had a couple of questions for uh, for Tom. Um, I'm going to skip down yeah. to those and we'll circle back into some of the others that, I, that I've that um, i skipped up above. Um, so Peach Van Wick was wondering, um, 
Tom, if you've looked for other respiratory pathogens or comorbidities in your captive sheep um, besides nasal tumors? Um, well, we look for the other, um, you know, the suite of respiratory pathogens that people talk about. And this group was more or less a closed group with the exception sometimes a, a ram was obtained to get them bred. Um, but the closed group seemed to have everything. Um, so they had MOB in the chronic carrier U, but we detected Mannheim hemolytica. We detected Biberstein trailosi. We detected Pastorella multacida. Um, I don't know that we ever tested them for lungworms. Um, we, they certainly had um, uh, Truparella, um, you know. So we did the sort of the routine testing that people have done and we found pretty much all of those pathogens. None of them, our testing was less regular for those and we certainly didn't find as any steady state situation like we did for MOV where there was a group, a, a pathogen associated with a particular U that was always detected or never detected. Um, it seemed to be um, come, come and going. And a lot of that is probably because that, the techniques for detecting those are, um, are not PCR. We use culture and probably had we used culture, we might have had more consistent results or if we had we used PCR. Um, the other comorbidities, I think we're probably waiting uh, for the other sheep to be necropsy to find out what else we might have found um, in them. They, we know that a couple of them that we have lost already um, have had typical old you things like bad teeth and abscesses and um, uh, so it, and and the kind of old animal lesions that the pathologists always find in uh, liver and lungs and so on. And then I think the last question in this section was from Julia, and she was wondering um, about whether you found any nasal um, sinus tumors at a Soden. No, we've never found sinus tumors at a sodium. And I could do one okay. more, or do we need to move on? Sorry. Um, no, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna step in and get a few of the um, raised hands. And Adam Grove, um, can you unmute and uh, ask your question? Yeah, this is a question for either Francis or Tom. You you mentioned the need to try to test all use in the population. Um, are you in danger of potentially starting all over if you end up missing a chronic carrier U when you're doing your sampling? Do you want me to answer that, Tom, or do you want to? <laughs> um, so I guess I'm not sure what you mean. If you don't, if you miss a U, is there potential for, for missing a chronic carrier? Yes, there is. Um, I'm, I'm just, if you end up missing that chronic carrier, or I mean, obviously they're still the, they would still be carrying it. So I guess I'm assuming there's some potential that they could basically reinfect, you know, at least a part of the herd or the entire herd. Okay. Well, the thing to remember is that this herd, sorry, go ahead. Didn't want to interrupt you, <laughs> but um, this herd has been infected. Right, they've that's they've been infected and recovered. So um, they've been living with that chronic carrier since um, you know since the outbreak or since she's been around. So I I'm not sure if I'm totally understanding your question, but it's not like anything different would happen if she was still there. And obviously when you sample, you need to mark all the animals that you've sampled. So, you know, okay, you've ruled out, ruled them out as chronic carriers. And if you, um, you know, aren't seeing a response, then yeah, you probably need to go back in and look for any unmarked use. If that doesn't answer your question, email me and I'll try to do better. Or to maybe Tom. That. Um, and that is, I think there probably is a process for new chronic carriers to emerge in a population over time. And I don't know exactly what that process is, um, but I think otherwise um, all MOV associated outbreaks would die off sooner than they have like in Hills Canyon. Um, 
it doesn't happen, doesn't seem to happen very often. So I don't know, it's not enough of a process to call it stuttering transmission. They don't play a key role, I don't think generally in um, keeping MOV there by passing you know, the infection from animal to animal. But I think there is a process where some new infections become chronic carriers and they um, will then persist. Um, I think it's not very fast. We've done it in, in domestic sheep in captivity where um, we have exposed them to MOV, exposed MOV negative sheep um, to new strains and they become infected and they consider, continue to shed it for a prolonged period of time. And I suspect that same process may happen in, in bighorn sheep. Just I think the work that Francis and others have done shows that in many populations, it's not important enough that you're starting over. It's just a potential complication that will prolong the test and remove process. At least that's how I think about it. Okay, we have um, another question from Mike Cox. Mike, do you wanna unmute and ask your question? Yeah, Vanna from Montana had a question about Tom, the your your thought of the lamb of a chronic care of you being a conduit for that year's nursery group spread of, of mycoplasma. And even though we, we do know that <clears throat> those lambs are going to clear it, that year and until you remove that that chronic carrier you, is it her? the you or is it her lamb that's contributing to the spread to the others? Uh, well, the, the you is obviously important because when there's a you there in our captive studies and we think in the wild, um, there's a really high risk that it's going to, that one lamb is going to get infected and then that first lamb is going to spread it to the cohort as they socialize through that first couple month period of life. The two things that I didn't talk about in my talk that um, led us to think that that the lamb of the carrier you might be important is the one year um, that the carrier you was the last one to lamb. Um, we saw what seemed to be less severe pneumonia in the rest of the lambs, and that was the first year one of the other lambs survived. Um, that one that survived was actually born after. Well, I, it, 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 anyway, there, there was there was delayed exposure, so that's that's what led to the idea of let's not breed the carrier you and see if that makes a difference. And we did see a later. Um, onset of pneumonia in the four lambs that were born to the non-carrier use that shared the um, pen with that carrier you and as I mentioned three out of four survived so um, I, I think that's part of the natural variability that probably happens a lot in new groups in the wild that might make a terrible year for lamb survival one year and not for the other but I'm not sure I answered the actual question so okay uh, William Moore has a question, and I think he has it also in the chat. So if it's, William, do you want to unmute and, yourself and ask this question, please? Sure. Yes. Thank you. Um, so this is mostly for Tom, and I'm just curious if there's been any research conducted to determine the probability of lambs that survive Moby becoming future chronic carriers as adults. Um, in, in a word, well, no. <laughs> I mean, it seems like a, a logical um, thing that would happen, but most often we find that those lambs clear the infection um, and we don't see it again in them. Um, so subject to the sensitivity of the PCR and everything else, we think they generally clear it, but it, uh, at some point it has to be either either those lambs or lambs that clear it that subsequently become reinfected that would become the new chronic carriers that would make it persist in the population over a long time. But I don't think we know much about that process at all. Maybe Francis has some ideas about that. I just want to throw in, this isn't directly related to lambs, but as far as recruiting new chronic carriers, one thing that we did find in the last dean that is that ewes that were older tended to be more likely to be chronic carriers. So it may be that, um, use that previously were able to resist infection as they get older, become chronic, chronic carriers. Great, thank you. I, I guess I'll throw in one other thing that might contribute to that, and that is this uh, perinatal sinus tumor um, issue, which might be something that lambs are unlikely to develop, but um, older animals that might tie together those two observations so that 
we we think that animals with those sinus tumors have are a lot uh, are a lot poorer at clearing um, MOV. The the one thing to remember is if there's no MOV in the population, they're not going to become chronic carriers. So you know. Okay, um, Don Whitaker has a question. And Don, can you um, unmute and ask your question, please? Yeah, I mean, all of the discussion so far is on the ewes and lambs, and I understand that, but what about the role of the rams? Okay, that's a good and very common question. Um, and, you know, the first year after we did a Soten, I didn't think that the rams were a factor in ammonia in lambs because we've had populations that um, are, well, first of all, the rams aren't really transmitting to lambs in most situations because they're sexually segregated. They're off somewhere else in their, on their summer range. But um, also um, we've had populations that have sub, subgroups of ewes and the rams move back and forth between those ewes, but the one group of ewes would have good lamb survival and the other did not, you know. So, um, uh, so when we did, when I did, so when I designed a Soten, I was like, well, I'm just going to focus on the ewes because that's, you know, we'll see if that works. And when the rut came up, especially the second year, I'm like, oh my gosh, there's all the, you know, the lambs survived and they had no antibodies and we're going to have, you know, are we going to have an outbreak? And we didn't. And um, so all I guess that means is it's possible to, that, you know, and at least in that situation, well, maybe the rams really aren't the ones maintaining MOV in the population. Why? I don't know. They don't live as long. Um, maybe there's something, you know, different about the way they're responding to MOV. I don't know. But so since then, um, I have, you know, we tested rams, but I really focused on ewes and um, it just seems that, and I'm not aware of, I'm not saying it, it doesn't happen, but I'm not aware of anybody that's found a chronic carrier ram. Probably, I'll probably be proven wrong today, but um, I, I just don't think they play as big of a role for some reason. I don't know why. Yeah, but you know, and I, I understand that, and I think you're probably right, Francis, but I think would it behoove us to, in our testing efforts for DV, DMV or whatever we're doing, to continue testing and collaring those rams because it could be that maybe we just haven't caught the rams that are testing positive and, and they still could for that short you know, a month long time period or whatever, when they're interacting with all of the subpopulations in the metapopulation, could they indeed, it seems reasonable to me, they could potentially become, as we've all thought for years, the, the carrier from herd to herd. And yeah, it's just, I, it's I, just I, the matter of our testing is insufficient on the rams. Mm, I guess maybe we'll let's think about that after we've gone through the case histories. But, um, but I I do think if you want to if if you you know if you want to test rams or if you have the ability the funding and everything to do it do it, but don't let that stop you from doing test and remove if you don't have the if you aren't able to test all the rams too. Okay, I am going to end questions right now um, and that'll keep us on time. As I said, we answered all the live questions and then in the chat, keep putting them down there and we will work to go ahead um, and get through those. So now we're going to um, start our official morning session.